Make sure your Bibles are still open to Luke chapter 5, looking at Peter's growing faith. Peter's growing faith. Very familiar passage and one we hear about and think about so often and many sermons are preached out of little phrases out of it. But we're looking tonight at Peter's growing faith. But just by way of introduction, notice as we look at this, it says there in verse number 1 of chapter 5, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, talking about pressing upon Jesus Christ, to hear the word of God. That's an amazing thing. They pressed to hear the word of God. Just by introduction, I want us to notice the attraction of the word of God. They were attracted by his preaching. They were attracted by his word. They were attracted by his teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what we need to have in our heart, an attraction to the Word of God. And as we go out and speak with folks who do not know the Word, that need to know the Word, we also need to pray that they will be attracted by the Word. Uh, we can try to attract people with music, but the day the music dies, uh, it's not going to work so well. We can attract people with all kinds of video things, but when the day the video things don't work, and they don't sometimes, it's all going to fall apart. But the idea, if we have the Word of God and preaching and teaching, the Word of God, if we're coming and being attracted by the Word of God, we will always have that. Whether we have electricity, whether we have the internet, whether we have slides or not, whether we have microphones or not, whether we have special music or not, it's the Word of God. And that's what Jesus was there. It says they pressed upon Him. They came close to Him to hear the Word of God. In Luke 4, 35, And Jesus rebuked Him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of Him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For what authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they came out. I like this. What a word is that? What in the world did we just hear? What did we just hear? What did we understand? What a word. By the way, I'm glad we hold in our hand, what a word. It's an amazing book, an amazing truth. Every bit of it is preserved. Every bit of it is inspired. Every bit of it there is to help us and strengthen us. It's what a word we have in Luke 4, 32. It says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word, talking about Christ, was with power. Oh, it's a, when you preach and teach the Word of God, it's in power. We don't have to be ashamed of it. We don't have to compromise it. We don't have to backpedal it. It is the Word of God with power. In fact, even the lost that those they had sent to arrest Jesus, and they came back and they had not arrested Jesus, and they said, how come? And the officers answered, never man spake like this man. They said, we just couldn't believe it. We couldn't arrest him. We couldn't get him because nobody speaks like him. His word that we have in our hand. Job said in Job 23, 12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He said, more than my food that I have to have. More than that. He said, I esteem it. I desire it. I honor it. I reverence it. If we're not careful, we will not reverence. We will not esteem the Word of God. We won't recognize the power behind the Word of God. We'll get lackadaisical about the Word of God. And that's what we see here as we talk about Peter's faith. It's this thing of the Word of God. In Psalm 19, it says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Those judgments, the Word of God. More to be desired are they. We're to desire the Word of God more. They should be desired more than gold. Yea, more than fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Oh, I hope we understand we ought to have this desire. We ought to have the desire for the Word of God more than gold, more than money. We're a little quiet on that because we sure want money. We sure desire money. We everything's focused on money. I preached not long ago, follow the money. Uh, so it is here. But more than the money, more than the gold, more than possessions, it is the Word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Does God's word joy and rejoice our heart? That's how it needs to be. And so as we think about these folks, they pressed around Jesus. They came close to Jesus. They violated the six feet rule and uh, pressed upon him to hear the word of God. By the way, it's worth endangering yourself to a little COVID virus to hear the word of God. Amen. Amen. They pressed upon him. 
So we find the attraction of the Word of God. We need to magnify it and lift it up and so people will be attracted to it. But not just the attraction of the Word of God, but I think we see here the anticipation for the Word of God. They anticipated. They pressed upon Him because they said, we want to hear more. They pressed upon Him because they anticipated hearing God speak. They anticipated God speaking to their heart. They anticipated Christ doing something in their heart and life with His Word. I hope we anticipate the Word of God. Now, if we would learn to do that, by the way, you can learn to anticipate. You can learn to look, fo look forward to something. I mean, if you anticipate vacation, boy, it's something that does something to you. When you anticipate having the time off, you anticipate a vacation, you anticipate spending time with your family, you anticipate these things. Boy, it makes such a difference in our life. We need to anticipate the Word of God. If we anticipate something, whether it be a trip to Disneyland or a trip to the resorts or a trip to the beach. Even the anticipation brings us pleasure. You know what I'm saying? When you just anticipate it, boy, it just brings pleasure. You're looking forward to it. You've got it planned out, and it brings pleasure as you anticipate it. And then when you actually partake in it, if you've been anticipating it, if you've been looking forward to it, you'll enjoy it so much the more. How many will understand that? Say amen. But when we've anticipated, boy, I just want it. I'm looking forward to it. Then when it comes, it's so exciting. So it is with the Word of God. We need to anticipate the Word of God. Tomorrow morning when you get up and open up your Word, you ought to anticipate it. Tonight when you go to bed, you ought to say, God, I'm looking forward to tomorrow, your Word. I'm looking forward for you, God, to speak to me tomorrow. I'm not going to be satisfied if I just read and I don't hear your Word. I don't hear you speak to me. It, that anticipation gives pleasure and the actual receiving of it gives pleasure. Come into the house of God, the church. Say, preacher, I sure wish I enjoyed church more. We'll learn to anticipate the word of God. Saying, God, I'm looking forward for you tell me something. I'm looking forward for your word to do something in my life. Anticipating it gives pleasure. They anticipated the word of God. They pressed upon him to hear the word of God. So anticipation for the word of God brings pleasure. To, to anticipate the word of God makes us present. I hope that's what we come for. It makes us here. We're here to, for one of many reasons, but one of them is to hear the Word of God. It helps us prepare to hear. If I'm anticipating, God, I want to hear from you. I'm looking forward to hearing the Word of God sung and preached and taught. I'm looking forward to it. We'll be better prepared. But if we're not anticipating it, they'll say, oh, I guess it's time to preach. Oh, I wonder what he's going to preach on. I don't know. We'll see. And, um, yep, yep, yep. 44 and a half minutes today. Mm-hmm. I know. Okay. I checked this time last night, and it was this long and this. But we'll be prepared to hear if we're anticipating it. And it'll make us prompt. We'll be in our place. So we find the attraction of the Word of God. Jesus there, they pressed upon Him. We find the anticipation. But as we get ready to find out about Peter's growth in his faith, we find the appointment with the plan of God. The appointment with the plan of God. As we look at this situation, we see Jesus had an appointment with Peter. There's no question about it. He said, I've got something I want to do in Peter's life. There's something I want to do with Peter. Peter has something I want to bless him with. I want to help him with. Because there was two ships there. Two ships. And Jesus got into one, and it just happened to be Peter's? I don't think so. He said, I'm getting in the Peter's boat. He said, I got a plan for Peter. I have an appointment plan with Peter. Don't miss your appointments with God. Don't miss your appointments with God. If Peter hadn't been there, if Peter had cut off a little early that night and gone to watch the Super Bowl, boy, he'd have missed out. If he'd gone fishing somewhere else, or if he'd gone to have dinner somewhere else, if he'd not been in his place, if he missed that appointment, what a, what a difference it would have made in his life and in our lives, as we see what God was trying to do. Don't miss your appointments with God. When I was preaching part of this at our chapel at our school, I mentioned the fact, I wish we could, but I can't send somebody else to make, an appoint, make, to make my dentist appointment. It would do me no good. It would make me feel good maybe for this time for a moment. I'd say, yeah, I've got a, I've got a root canal scheduled. i got an appointment for a root canal. Would you go do my appointment for me? Whew. That would do us no good. It would do her no good and it would do me no good. We can't 
Has somebody else had our appointments with God? We must make our appointments with God. Let's don't miss it. You're here tonight because you do not want to miss your appointment with God. You open your Bible in your private time in your closet because you do not want to miss your private time with God. So tonight we're looking at Peter's growing faith. We're going to see four steps tonight in Peter's growing faith. Four steps to grow in faith. By the way, faith is a process. It is steps. It is progression. The Bible talks about those that had no faith. Those that had little faith, those that had much faith, those that had great faith. But it was progress. Here we find Peter's progress. We're finding it progresses quickly in this story, but it's still steps. Did you know your faith can progress quickly? It's going to be by steps, but it can be much faster. Some folks have been saved many years, and they've not progressed very quickly. Some folks get saved, and they go by steps. It's still steps. It's still progression, but it happens so much faster. It all depends on how we receive that faith and how we receive what we're seeing tonight. In 2 Thessalonians 1 3, it says, But we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly. There's an opportunity for us to have our faith grow exceedingly. I don't know about you, but I need my faith to grow this year. I need my faith to grow this week. I need my faith to grow this month. And I'm praying and asking God to help me and let it grow in that. In Luke 17, 5, the apostles said in the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. So tonight, very simple, four steps of Peter's growing faith. Not hard, not difficult to understand, very simple. But it's those simple things, steps that he, can, he took that you and I have to take. Are you with me tonight? Okay, stay awake and we'll go faster. So here we go. Step number one. By faith, he loaned his boat. By faith, he loaned his boat. Look at verse number three. And he, that is Jesus, entered one of the ships, which, Simon, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. We find, first of all, Peter's presence. He was there. He was there. By the way, what's that old expression? Showing up is half the battle. I mean, just showing up is half the battle. I mean, just... Having a good paying job and not losing your job, just showing up is a major part of the battle. You may not have done very well, you may struggle, but just showing up, not showing up on the job, you won't have it very long. But we find his presence, he was there. It was the end of the day. They had already done all their work and they were out and they were cleaning their nets, they were done. I should say the work was almost done. I don't know. I've never been a professional fisherman. I've never even been a good amateur fisherman. I think I've told you before, I had a boss in the Navy years ago who said there's two kinds of people. There are fishermen and those who fish. I just fished, all right? I could never gain that. But I don't know. But I don't, I don't imagine that cleaning the nets was the favorite part of the job. I don't think cleaning the nets, I don't think Peter would get up in the morning and say, oh boy, I get to go fishing, and the sooner I get fishing, the sooner I can clean the nets. I don't think that was the desire, I don't think, but that was part of the job. That was what was necessary to finish the job. Well, if we get nothing else tonight, let's learn to finish the job. If he hadn't finished the job, if he hadn't been there, he would have missed out on that appointment. So we find his presence being there. But notice then we find not just Peter's presence, we've got to be there, but notice Jesus' prayer. Jesus prayed. Notice what it says. Verse number 3, And he entered into the, one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He asked him. Just like we pray, we ask. He prayed him. He said, would you? Would you go? Would you, would you, would you launch out? He said, I'm in your boat. Would you? Would you push out a little bit? Would you launch out a little bit? Would you push away from the land just a little bit? I want you to picture it. Jesus was in the boat already. He said, Peter, would you push out? Hey, Peter, I'm in your boat. Peter, I'm in your boat. I want to bless you. Peter, I'm in your boat. I need you something to do. He entered in first and then asked if he would push out. As I thought that, as I had that picture in my mind, I wonder how many times and what right now Jesus is in your boat, if you will, 
waiting on you. He's there. He's praying you. He's asking you. He's inviting you. He's waiting on you. What is it tonight that Jesus is in your boat waiting for you, waiting for me? You probably know what it is. You've heard him say, just like he said to Simon. He said, Cider, Simon, come on. He said, I'm waiting for you. I'm right here in your boat. This is your boat. I'm asking you to come and push out just a little bit. Well, don't make Jesus keep waiting. He's praying. That's, that's an amazing thought. He prayed to him. He asked him, just as we pray to the Lord. He was asking Peter to do it. We find Jesus' prayer. He's trying to grow Peter's faith. So he's coming to him, and if he's just asking, first of all, just loan me your boat. Just loan me your boat. He said, I'm not asking you something impossible. I'm not asking you something hard. Just loan me your boat. Then we find Peter's push. Peter's push. So Peter was tired. Peter was done for the day. He was washing his nets. Jesus walked out there, got in his boat, and sat there and said, Okay, Peter, come on, push me out. Let's take me out. Let me borrow your boat just a little bit. Thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. He pushed out a little. Notice what it says. And thrust out a little from the land. The word little there is very often used in the Bible. In the Greek, it means puny. Puny, just a little, just a weak thing, just a sickly thing. You know what I'm saying? Somebody said, well, come on, we're going to fight. I don't mind fighting you. You're kind of puny. Or maybe you're really, really hungry, and your wife has you on a diet, and you come down really expecting a big, I mean, you know, ham and eggs and grits and fried apples and, and hash browns and uh, French toast, and boy, you are all set. Boy, here it comes. And what do you got? You got a little egg white sitting there and a piece of a little cutie orange. And if you're not very spiritual, you'll say, that's pretty puny. That's a puny breakfast. Jesus says, I want you to push out just a puny amount. Just a puny, just a little sacrifice. Just a little inconvenient. He said, I'm not asking you to do much. He said, I'm asking, I'm here, I'm waiting on you. But push out just a little bit. Just a puny amount. But what's amazing, that puny amount was a great help for the Lord. Are you listening to me? That puny amount, that pushing out just a little bit that got him away from the shore just far enough for the water to help catch his voice and for the people there on the shore that were pressing against him so he could speak and others could hear. That little puny help was a great help. We sing that song, Little is Much When God is in It. So the first thing for his first step of faith was, just loan me your boat. Just a puny little push. Just a puny little push away. So I ask tonight, first of all, is there something puny God wants you to do that would be a great help? Just something puny? Something puny God wants you to do to further the kingdom, to reach for souls? He's not asking you to be burned at the stake. He didn't say, Peter, I want you to be crucified upside down. That, we know that's what tradition tells us happened to Peter later on, but that's not what he asked him now. He didn't ask him to die with it. He just says, just push out a little bit. Best I can tell on the timeline, Peter had already, had his brother had already brought him to Jesus. And now Jesus shows up later there and he says, I want you to just do a little something for me. He didn't ask him to be burned at the stake. He didn't ask him to go to Africa and be a missionary. He said, just be puny. Just push out a puny amount. Just do something puny. Just do something little. What puny thing has God asked you to do that you won't do? I have to ask myself that. What puny thing that God is saying, this is what I'd like you to do to further the kingdom, to help me a whole lot. But what is it? What is it that we're saying no? There's a lot of puny things that God can bless. A lot of puny things that God would have us to do. And these are the first steps in faith. He loaned him his boat. I'm talking about just being a doorman or a doorwoman at the church. I've said it for years. My goal is that nobody walking up these steps have to open the door themselves to come to church. It doesn't take a brain surgeon. It doesn't take somebody giving their life blood to open the door. You don't even, you don't even have to study for that. 
You don't have to go to college for that. You can just say, this is just something puny. I can open the door for people. I can be out there so when a guest comes up, they say, I wonder, what, I wonder if it's all right if I come in. I wonder if it's all right if I go in. Or, no, somebody says, come on in and open the door for them. It doesn't take brain surgery. I take that back. We have, we have excellent, highly educated, qualified people that take a little white stick and put it next to their forehead and go, mm -hmm. You can be in the medical field. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll give you the honorary title of doctor. You can take their temperature. Praise the Lord for the ones we have. But you know, we can do it. You say, well, that's just puny. It's a big help. It's a big help. Whether it be a screener or just handing out door hangers. Taking a room to clean in the church. Say, this is mine. To cut the grass. To carry out the trash. Whatever it is. Just something puny. But we can be involved in it. That's the first step of faith. Is you launch the, he just loaned the boat. He said, let me just do it. Yeah, but the problem is, once you take it on, fulfill it. Amen. Just don't do it once. Just don't do it twice. But you fulfill it. But he loaned the boat. The first step of faith was he just loaned it. The boat. He, says, he, didn't, he didn't say, give me your boat. He didn't say, burn your boat. He just says, loan me your boat. First step of faith. Peter was at the end of his day. He loaned his boat. Doing something puny. I call it puny because it was little, but to Peter it was probably wasn't that puny right then. He's tired. How many of you look back in your life and remember as a child or a teenager, something seemed so big, so hard, such a big step of faith. And as adults, you look back and say, that was nothing. That's nothing. How many looking back now... Adults would say, I think back in high school and having to study a little bit. Throw me in that briar patch. All right. Somebody else fixes my meal. Somebody else does my laundry. Somebody else takes care of my bed. Oh, and all I have to do is go to school and have them teach me. Well, at the time you thought that was tough. At the time you thought that was hard. But now you say, boy, I'll take that back again anytime. But at the time it was hard. So you may be sitting here. Others may be watching and say, boy, that... That little, that first step of being a doorman or a doorwoman or cleaning a church or handing out a gospel tracts or something, that just seems so big. It may seem that way, but it's that first step of faith. Step number one, he loaned his boat. He loaned his boat. Jesus says, let me borrow your boat for a minute. Number two, by faith, he launched his boat. By faith, he launched his boat. And so now we're progressing very quickly, but the next step of faith we find in verse number four. And when he had left speaking, so Peter got at the end of the day, he was tired, he was washing his nets, he was doing his job, finishing up. Jesus got in his boat and said, Peter, I, said, I want you to go ahead and uh, let's puny out a little bit. Just push us out just a little bit. But Peter had to be there. Peter had to do it. He was tired. He was weary. And he said, all right. And I said, I'll do it. I'm going to loan you my boat. Now Jesus says, here's the next step. I want you to launch out. Verse number 4. Now when they had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets far a draught. So here we hear the command. We hear the command. See, he prayed him to loan his boat. He said, let me, let me just borrow your boat. Let me just ask you to borrow your boat. Can I borrow your boat, Peter? Can you push out just a little bit? He prayed him. He asked him. He besought him. But now we don't find that same attitude, that same spirit. Before he prayed him, he would launch out a little bit, or to push out a little bit. Now he says, he just says to him, launch out into the deep. Now we've got a command. By the way, that's kind of growing in faith. You go from a request to a command. You say, that's fine. Your, your, command, your, your desire is what is my command. I want to do that. That's a little bit of growing in faith. You don't have to be begged to do it. You don't have to be prayed to do it. You say, oh, that's what Jesus wants. That's what I'm going to take as my command. Growing in faith, taking a little meat, taking some command, taking some orders from the Lord, picking up the pace, growing in faith. He, so he prayed him. He just said, said just, just puny push me out. And he did that. He says, now, Peter, the next step in your growth of faith, he said, I want you to launch out into the deep. Wow. It's that next growing in thing. He wanted him to launch, first of all, to a place. He said, I want you to launch to a place, to the deep, to the deep. He was there apparently in the shallows. But I said, I want you to go out into the deep. By the way, it takes more force to get out into the deep. It took more effort to get out into the deep. It was more inconvenient for him to get out into the deep. 
It required more commitment to get out into the deep. He said, yeah, we're going to go out away from the shore. See, while they were just pushed out a little bit, I can almost see Simon Peter said, well, I'll do that because if I get too tired, I'll just get out of the boat and go home. If Jesus preaches too long, I'll just get out of the boat and wade over and leave, and he can take care of the boat. I, I got partners out there that will take care of the boat. I'll just leave. But if you're out in the deep, it's pretty tough just to get out and walk home. Peter hadn't learned to walk on water yet. That comes later. <laughs> so he says, out in the deep, it's a commitment. He said, I can't just leave. I just can't abandon this. I just can't go if this goes too long. And I get too tired. It requires more commitment. It requires more faith. Because while he's in the shallow, if it begins to sink, that's no biggie. I mean, Got that much water, so you sink, you say, oh, wow. Yeah. But out in the deep, it requires more faith. So is the, the launch to a place. So the next step of faith is the launching the boat. He asked him, let me loan, let me borrow your boat. He said, yeah, I'll loan you my boat. But now he said, I want you to launch your boat out into the deep. More commitment, more faith. It's not just launch to a place, but launch for a purpose. Listen carefully. He didn't ask him before. Before he said, I want you to just push out a little bit. I want, to, I want you to loan me your boat. And just sit there and listen. Oh, okay. He said, now I want you to launch out into the deep and work. And work. He said, to let down your nets. Notice what it says. Now when he finished preaching, verse number 4, speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Now it's time for work. Not just sitting, but laboring. But laboring. Let me help you with something. Faith and labor go together. Faith and work go together. You read Hebrews 11, by faith they did this. By faith they, they just didn't by faith feel something. By faith they did something. In James 2, verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And so here he says, I hear, I want you to chip, grow in your faith. I want you to launch out, not just to a place, but to a purpose to do some work. Boy, if we want to increase our faith, it will increase our work. The greater our faith, the greater our works will be. Amen. So we say, oh, preacher, I want to grow in faith. All right, expect God to expect to some more works out of us. So we hear a command. He said, launch out. But then we cringe at the complaint. We cringe at the complaint. Here it is, verse 5. Peter's growing in faith. Sure he is. Verse 5, And Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Let me give it to you in the, in the Greek. Wah, wah, wah. He said, launch out of the deep. Wah, wah, wah. Master, we've worked all night. We've worked so hard and we didn't get nothing. I don't want to do it. How come, they, how come you asking me to do it? I don't want to go out there. I'm tired. I still got to finish my nets and then I got to go home and I probably have to wash the dishes because it's Valentine's Day and my wife didn't want to do it so I'm going to have to do that and I'm going to come back tomorrow. I just, he said, we've worked all night and we didn't do anything. We tried and got nothing. Way, 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 way. I've done my part. Why can't somebody else do the part? Let me give you the words of the great theologian, T.E.F., Tennessee Ernie Ford. Bless your pea-picking heart. But we whine about everything. We say, oh, I want God to use me. All right, I want you to do this. What? Maybe I got to get up at 6 in the morning. Let me help you with something. And you've probably been on the other side of that. You know I had to get up at 6 in the morning? Did you know I had to get up at 6 in the morning? Did you know I had to get up at 6 in the morning? And you're standing there and telling you that, and you had to get up at 3. Hello. And you know how dumb that sounds when somebody says that? But we say to the Lord, well, I don't want to do that. I don't. Boy, we hear and we, we cringe at the complaint. But he's growing in faith. He's growing in faith. To launch his boat. Step three, by faith he loaded his boat. boat. He loaded his boat. Let's don't complain when God asks us to do things. That's just growing in faith. But notice by faith he loaded his boat. Verse number five. 
And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. But notice we recognize a guarded commitment. A guarded commitment. He did his Baptist thing. Wah, wah, wah. But we can give him this, a guarded commitment. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. We can see the disobedience. Jesus said, let down your nets. He says, I'll let down one. I'll let down one. But the guarded commitment, he says, nevertheless, at thy word. Let me help you with something. If we can just get that our mantra, our bottom line, our minimum spirituality, nevertheless, at thy word. I don't want to. Nevertheless, at your word. I don't think it's going to work out. Nevertheless, at thy word. But it's going to wear me out. It's going to cost me stuff. Nevertheless, at thy word. Simon Peter said, I'm tired. I'm wore out. We didn't work. It didn't work before. I don't think it'll work again. Nevertheless, at thy word word because when listen when everything when everything else fails when all else fails that'll still get you the blessings nevertheless at thy word if he didn't have that guarded commitment he said what we've tried all night we worked all night and caught nothing I'm not going to do it wow what a loss what a loss but he had that baseline nevertheless it goes back to where he says master Verse 5, and Simon answering him said unto him, Master, he'd already met him. He said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. That guarded commitment will help us get the blessings. That guarded commitment will keep us out of trouble. That guarded commitment will keep us in his service. If we can just say, nevertheless, at thy word thy word I think of the widow with the cruise of oil remember Elijah was there and she had gone well I'll just read it for you Elijah showed up to the widow God had sent him to the widow and said she'll take care of you and he said make me some cake and she said as the Lord thy God liveth I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. In other words, she said, she just says, according to your word, said, we're going to die, nevertheless, at God's word. Nevertheless, you say that's what God says, that's what I'll do. Nevertheless, I don't see how it's going to happen. We're planning on dying. We're just going to gather this up and we're going to make one meal and we're going to eat it and die. Nevertheless, at that word. If you and I can just get to the place in every aspect of our life, we'll just say, nevertheless, at thy word. But preacher, I, people will mock me, nevertheless, at his word. But people might, might turn their backs on me, nevertheless, at his word. But it may cost me something in this life. Nevertheless, at thy word. Because that's where the blessings are, and that's where the continuance going, and that's where the faith grows. Nevertheless, at thy word. I don't know how I don't know how many times I could tell you in my life it came just down to that point. Nevertheless, at his word. Because one, we don't understand. Peter didn't understand what was going to happen. He said, Nevertheless, at your word. Why is that going to be? God, why is it? Doesn't matter why it is. Nevertheless, at His word. That's the growing of faith. He loaded His boat. We have the guarded commitment. We think of the guarded commitment of Naaman and Elisha. Remember Naaman? He said, go dip seven times in the river. And he said, I'm not going to do it. And the servant says, listen, if we ask you to do something hard, you'd do it. At least do this. Though Naaman didn't say it, that's what he did. He said, all right. I don't believe it. He says, the rivers at home are better than this, and he should have come out and touched me and said some mumbo-jumbo over me. He should have done something. But nevertheless, I'll go do it. 
and he was healed. What is it tonight? You need to stop arguing with God and say, nevertheless, at thy word. Changes in our life, changes in our attitude, starting things, stopping things, nevertheless. We know it's his word, but we've been fighting it. We know it's his word, but we're missing it. We want to grow in faith, loading the boat, loading the boat by just having that guarded commitment, nevertheless, at thy word. So we see the guarded commitment. Then we see a glorious catch, a glorious catch. Verse 5, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so they began to sink. Wow! Wow! What an amazing catch! What an amazing miracle! What an amazing thing! Because, listen, God blesses obedience. God blesses obedience. If Simon Peter would say, No, we've toiled all night and taken nothing. I'm not going to do it. Jesus could have said, No problem. All you fish, jump in their boat. He could have done that. Because he had the fish get in that net. They'd tried all night. He had the fish do that. He could have said, Jump in the boat, but that's not how he works. He says, No, you throw out your net. And he said, I'll fill it. Jesus blesses obedience. Jesus' blessings, I think we see from here, is proportional to our obedience. What if he let down all his nets? I think they would have all been full. I think they all would have broken. But he just let down the one. But what's exciting is when Simon Peter was obedient, and we got that glorious catch far as obedience, others were blessed also. He said, come, give me a hand, let me load you up too. And boy, they had, you know, for us, we say fish. Well, that's kind of nice, but that means I have to clean them. That means we have to cook them. That means it's going to smell. And we'll have to have two garbage cans, and we probably won't get it all done. This, we'll have to do it for three weeks. The garbage man's going to come tomorrow. No, that was money. That was money. That's dollars. Every one was some money. Every dollar was a, was a was part, part of the next iPad. Every, every, every fish was something that was worth it. And so now it was flowing over to others. He was blessing others by his obedience. I don't know about you, but I can look at my life, and I know I've been blessed many times by others' obedience. Others getting blessed because they obeyed spills over on me. My desire. And your desire ought to be is that my blessings fall on somebody else also. Just overflows. It may be with the spouse. It may be with the kids. It may be with grandparents. It may be with coworkers, other church members. But oh, it just spills over. We get to share. Let's be a blessing to others. Well, I don't want to do it. I'm tired. Nevertheless, at thy word, I want to be a blessing to somebody else. Nevertheless, at thy word, I want you to bless me so I can bless others. So we see the glorious catch. Started out, just loan the boat. Just puny, just loan the boat. Sit there and listen. Okay. Now, next step of faith, I want you to launch out <laughs> into the deep and do some work. He was already tired. He said, I want you to launch out. Then we see he loaded his boat by faith because he was just had enough faith to go ahead and let down a net. But then we, we feel his great conviction. As his faith grew, we see his conviction that came. Verse number 7. And when they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship, they should come and help him, help them. They came and filled both ships, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. Well, you can feel his conviction. Well, he fell on his face. He fell on his knees to Jesus. He just says, get away. He wasn't, really wasn't wanting Jesus to go away, I don't think. But he was just saying, man, I feel, my, I feel like I have no, I'm not worthy. God, go away. I don't feel worthy to come to you. I'm under such conviction. He was under conviction, I believe, because he had a bad spirit. He just said, I, I don't want to do it. We've tried that. Nevertheless, at thy word we will. Now, we can read that like he had great faith. Nevertheless, at thy word, we No, he, I don't think it's so. He said, nevertheless, but we'll go ahead. I don't want to, but we will. I don't think it's going to work, but we will. Now he saw what happened. He said, wow, I'm a sinful man. That was sinful. He said, my spirit was wrong. My attitude was wrong. 
My speech was wrong. Let's learn from him so we don't have to go through that. Growing in faith. He felt conviction over a bad spirit. I think he felt conviction because of his unbelief. He just didn't believe it. He said, oh, it's not going to work. He had conviction because of his disobedience. Jesus said, let down your nets. He said, I'll let down one. Whew. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where when the blessings came and I realized, boy, what a rotten sinner I am. How I failed him. We feel his great conviction. Let's grow in faith. Step one, he just loaned him the boat. Yeah, you can borrow my boat. Just a little puny thing, no big deal. He launched his boat. All right. Going out farther. Going to do some work. Wow, another step of faith. I've gone from just sitting there in the back listening and now I'm out there working. Then by faith he loaded his boat. Oh, labored and worked and was blessed. And lastly, by faith he left his boat. By faith he left his boat. Verse 10, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Jesus, back at the first, didn't say, Simon Peter, I want you to leave everything and follow me. He said, no, he says, just loan me your boat. Oh, okay. I'm not sure at that time, if he said, Simon Peter, leave all that stuff, just come follow me. I doubt if Peter had the faith to do that. At that time, he said, no, just loan me your boat. Boy, I remember in my life where Jesus first said, loan me your boat. Just show up. Just be there. Oh, okay. Takes a little bit of faith to do that. Show up on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I, I can do that. I remember then he later on says, yeah, I want you to launch out. Get some work done. Take some next steps. Progress with me. Go out into the deep. Commit yourself. Then load the boat. Oh, the labors and the work, but the blessings. Now he says, we've gone that step. Now let's leave your boat. We find, first of all, it was a call for faith. It was a call for faith. And Jesus said unto Simon, verse number 10, Fear not. <laughs> he said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. How many have ever been afraid? Oh, all the time. Isn't that silly? We look at Simon Peter, Don't be afraid, Simon. Don't be afraid. Boy, God's got some wonderful things for you. If God lets Simon see, Simon's probably in heaven looking at us and says, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What are we fearing tonight? Rejection? Jesus was rejected. What are we fearing tonight? Sacrifice? He's done so much. It's a call of faith. Don't fear. That's growing in faith. Didn't take much didn't probably have much fear to sit in the back of his own boat and watch Jesus preach. Didn't take necessarily a lot of faith. Probably wasn't very fearful to go ahead and launch out because that's what he did every day. By faith, he boy, he received the blessings. By the way, not much fear in receiving blessings. Whoa, that's the good stuff. But now, so I got something else for you. I want you to leave your boat. A call for faith. A challenge to fish. A challenge to fish. He was a fisherman, but there was something new. Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. He said, now I'm going to make you a soul winner. Now we're going to go after people. Now you're going to be a preacher. Now we're going to take the word. We're going to do something new and different. By the way, growing in faith is always something new. Are you listening to me? It's always something new. You don't grow in faith without doing something new, without taking a further step, without going on. He says, fear not. He said, you just went from loaning me your boat and now to launch out, and then now you've got the blessings and you loaded up your boat. He says, but now we're getting ready to do something more. I'm going to have you leave your boat and do something more, a challenge to fish. Growing in faith is always something new. But then there was a choice to forsake. A choice to forsake, verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all. They chose to forsake it. Jesus didn't demand it. He called them. 
They could have, by free of will, said, no, not going to give it up. Not going to give it up. I'm content with this. I'm satisfied with this. I feel good about this. I know all about this. I'm at ease with this. But they made the choice to forsake. They forsook it all. We look back at that, and for them we say, well, they, of course they should do that, because they can't take it with you. Simon Peter, we're going to go catch fish. Can I take my boat? No, you can't take your boat. We're going out in the desert. Can I take my nets? Can't take your nets. It's a choice to forsake. By the way, we're not going to take anything with us out of here either. All we'll have in heaven is what we send ahead. Can't take anything from here with us. That's why the Bible, that's why Jesus said, Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what about the sacrifice? Jesus gave it all. I don't know where I first read it, but we worry about losing things because we sacrifice, because we forsake places or people or possessions. It's been said, it's no fool to trade what you cannot keep to gain what you will never lose. You listen? It's no fool to trade what you cannot keep to gain what you will never lose. I can't give that. Oh, no. Not only a choice to forsake, but lastly, and this is so key, a champion to follow. A champion to follow. Verse 11, when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all. If that was the end of the paragraph, that was the end of the sentence, that might be sad. They forsook all. Forsook all. I'm giving it all up. But that's not the end. And followed him. And followed him. The forsaking wasn't forsaking sake. Forsaking was for following sake. You can't do better than following Jesus. Did you hear what I said? You can't do better than following him. He's the champion. Here's the one we're supposed to follow. So who are you following tonight? Who am I following tonight? We sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. That's growing in faith. So I'm forsaken, but not just forsaking purpose, but to follow. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, and we'll be done. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Peter's growth of faith in this section was very rapid, but it was in four steps. You may have been saved 30 years and still on step one. Still struggling with just loaning your boat. Maybe you've gone to step two or three. Maybe you've made it to four. But how are you, your faith growing tonight? Let's bow our heads.